here in the perimeter, there are no stars. Out here, we is stoned, immaculate. Hello and welcome. This is the C86 Show. I'm David Eastall. As you know, we love a special guest. This week, it's going to be the turn of the rock band from the early 80s. It is Play Dead, who I um, recently spoke to one of their members, the drummer, Mark Whiff. Smith to find out more about life, love and poetry. Recently I mean very recently, they've just had a compilation that has been brought out 2023, this is titled The Collection, which is a collect, which is a, or their best of basically, which is available from all good record shops and probably as a download as well. But this is the interview so you can find out much more about the band thankfully. Um, so after several minutes of interest and casual chat, we get down to that exciting subject that was the early formative years. And Mark is going to tell us everything now. Mark, it's over to you. Not, not in that, not from then really. No, I was still listening to sort of. Uh, uh, well, Slade was my thing at school. Actually, you had to be. As I'm sure many have told you, you had to be on the side of. Uh, uh, Slade, Bowie, T Rex, or Sweet, you know, all those sort of bands. And my thing was Slade, actually. I got really into Slade. Yes. Well, I think in, in a way, they, they've they become sort of more, re, you know, critically renowned years well, later than they were at the time. Because a lot of people, I mean, you're right. A lot of people do say, God, Slade were just amazing. You know, yeah. Those, you know, yeah, they, they were. Were. Yeah. I never saw them live. I would love to have seen them live. They must have been. A, a rocky man. I mean, it's because they all had the skinhead following, didn't they? As well. They did. I know the early <laughs> image. I suppose it was a bit like status quo, who looked so different in the kind of sixties mm. period to their kind of classic seventies period. So, did you did you come from a musical family at all? Did any of your brothers or dad, mum were they at all? Uh, I, 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 well, I, I, I suppose I did in a little in a little way. My mum always used to play. Uh, we always used to listen to Top of the Pops all day, every day throughout the week and then she'd record it again on the Sunday on a reel to reel that we'd listen to the next lot. So I always had music playing uh in at home. And then my auntie was a bit of a a rebel in her time in the sixties. She used to work at a, a speakeasy in in London right. and uh, and she used to have a, a stall on Kensington Market making leather leather goods, um mainly leather jackets. Uh, you'll see pictures of Roger Daltrey and quite a few people of that time wearing tasseled jackets. Woodstock, sixty nine. Yeah. Well, well, you'll see, well, you'll see a lot of um, sort of English bands wearing them, and 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 they mostly would have been made by my aunt. <laughs> <laughs> and that she used to a... hang around with them all. I mean, she was uh, she was a real musical person, and that's and I suppose my my apart from my sort of pop background, which I got from my mother, my my next step into the musical world was listening to, I suppose, late, mid to late 70s music, a lot of American West Coast. And that would have been from being with my aunt. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So she was into like the birds, love. Yeah. All that Hendrix. I mean, she dated Hendrix for a while, actually. So uh, she sat in on the, uh, now, what album was it? Uh, uh, she sat in at Air Studios while he was doing Bold as Love, I think it was. Wow, that's 67, 67. Yeah, yeah. So, but but yeah, but then it was all the West Coast. I, when I sort of got into it, I mean, I, I didn't really know her that very well then. I wasn't really spending lots of time with her. But when I got to, in my mid-teens, I spent an awful lot of time with her. And by then she was listening to, and she, well, she introduced me to a lot of the sort of West Coast music like the Doobie Brothers and Steely Dan and uh, Little Feet and sort of bands like that. Wow, that's a that's a classic. I remember my my boss from my very early years. He was he was he'd got into the sort of he was part of that 60s, you know, he was in London in the 60s and sort mm. of all the, you know, like Hendrix and Clapton and Cream and and what he loved the Who, but then sort of during that sort of 70s, I suppose went into the, you know, the Grateful Dead you know, Little Feet, all those kind of bands, you know, much more. It was a bit, I think it was a lot to do with the smoking, actually, the, you know, the <laughs> that that kind of... It was know, to do with that, yes, of course it was. Yeah. <laughs> that sort of uh, 70s, you know, people are a bit older, they're no longer sort of quite on the zeitgeist, they've got a few, you know, like a, yeah, they've kind of partnered up, haven't they? They've got a relationship, yes, yes, a marriage. Yeah, yeah. 
a few kids and suddenly they're sort of having a quick sort of smoke aren't they and sort of listen to some cool kind of west coast vibes really well, they're big and, hi-fi systems yes <laughs> <laughs> i know they were so big in those days aren't they massive, <laughs> massive speakers yeah <laughs> massive speakers and yet you know now we have these little things which are like just as good but yeah so that was god she was such a cool dude to have to know oh, well, she was it's, uh, i used to run away to her a lot actually in the in my late teens yeah yeah yeah, yeah. and spend and what, time up there uh, uh, absorbing her world I and doing all the drinking and the smoking and all the things I couldn't do at home. Yes, well, quite. I'm sure she was a good influence on you. Mm. But what was what was her memory of of the sort of swinging sixties and the summer of love? Was she was she just on that zeitgeist moment? Listen, you know, with you know, I, like... I, she. I've never really. She hasn't really spoken heavily about it. I mean, she went to um. Uh, she went down to Ibiza. I mean, what? No, what's the island off Ibiza uh, um, where a lot of them used to hang around and. Um, uh, and and I she didn't really speak much about her time at the speakeasy, but I know she hung around with a lot of uh, stars, so to speak, at that time. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. This is this is very nice. So, look, who who thought that was a? When did you think? Right, I'm into music. I'm going to start becoming. I want to become a musician. Did that sort of happen in the seventies? Well, that actually happened via her as well, because she had. Uh, a friend of hers in Liverpool. She was based in Liverpool originally, and she moved back up to Liverpool when I started staying with her. And they had a friend who used to work for the Beatles. Well, they, uh, well and he was a drummer, and he had a he had a kit um, at his father's department store, right up in the attic um, at the far at his father's department store. And uh, and I used to go up there and just spend the day up there, just bashing away and no one could hear me and I could make as much racket as I liked and I got really and he'd come up every now and then and say oh just try this one make it do this and listen and I started to get really into the playing of that and yeah and that was that was me hooked from then on actually <laughs> yes drop, absolutely rhythm, you didn't have any and, and sort of yeah that 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 part of music yeah so what was your kind of first single you bought at that stage in you know in your formative years you know what I didn't buy many singles. I always bought albums. And I hate to say this, but my first album was a best of the Beatles. That was a client. That was a bit Alan Partridge. <laughs> it was. <laughs> it was. It was the best, what? Which I, I don't think you can get now. I don't think it wasn't one of the it wasn't the blue or the red one. It was the bit it was the best of the Beatles, of course, probably when they'd just come to the end. I, I don't think I've seen a um I don't think I've seen the cover of it since, actually, but yeah, that was my first, yeah. And oh, I, I didn't listen to singles. I mean, I, I listened to singles from the radio, but I tended to buy albums. Yes, well, there you go. I know. Well, those two iconic Beatles albums were in most people's collection, weren't they? Oh, well, yes, the blue and the red one, yeah. But it, but it wasn't those, because it, it must have been, because it was more of their pop, it was more of their early stuff. Right. I I would have, when I would have bought it, I must have been, it must have been 14, so 70. 72, 73, 70, yeah, so that's all the time. And what was your first gig you went to? <laughs> my first one, again, my aunt took me. To go and <laughs> I was going to say, I bet your aunt took you. Well, yeah, it was up in Liverpool. She took me, to, and I was very, very young. I was only about seven or eight years old. Blimey. And it was uh, to see, well, Dave D. Dozy Mikatich, was it? <laughs> I can't remember the full order, who was supporting the Bee Gees. Right. Well, this is this is this is very cool, you know. <laughs> it was pretty cool. <laughs> I went and, backstage and I was very impressed that they had Coca Cola back there. Nice, yeah. It was quite a luxury item at that stage, wasn't they? Oh, that's very good. So, What's did you <laughs> did you have any older brothers or sisters who kind of influenced you at all? No, no not at all. No, no. I've got a younger sister, but no, she's not really, you know, into music like I became. No. No. Yes. So when you got to that ripe old age of 16 and you were sort of leaving school, did you stay on for sixth form or did you? I did stay on, but it all went very poorly after that because, of course, 16 up, 76, the pistols were there and it was just it just hit me. And I, that was it. That was it for me. Right. I was another tangent from that point on. So my A levels, my O levels were great and my A levels were miserable. It wasn't gonna. Did you grow up in Oxford then? Was that your home? No, I was, in, I was in. I grew up in rugby, and then we moved to Banbury in my latter uh, year. Yeah, latter, latter teens. Yeah. Yes. So then, sort of the late seventies, were mm. you sort of then 
doing music or were you just doing odd jobs and what was no i wasn't doing i was no i mean i sort of stayed on at school and then i got a then i got a real job for about uh was a computer programmer actually um when you never saw the computer as a computer program. All the programs we wrote were with a pencil and pad. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Those were the very early days, aren't they? I mean, we very were early. excited as well. Had a digital just, watch, and that was it. Was it was just changing when I left that job, which must have been about eighty one, eighty two. They just bought these first one to one computers. Just bought them then, uh, uh, and where you were programming them, they were self programming. Like I suppose, like word is to us today, but I mean it's a lot more trivial than that. Then, but I mean, but even that was quite a revelation. Then, instead of a big mainframe computer like like you see on James Bond films, which is what we've been using up to that point. Yes, and uh, there's a, there's a classic picture in Norwich um, at the county uh, the county council office with some massive looking, you know, yeah, massive looking. I don't know. Not a chest freezer, much bigger than that. No, 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 no. It's a huge it's room. Huge <laughs> space, you know, probably. With lots of tapes spinning around backwards of all you know, it's great. Well, yes, it was Bond, wasn't it, really? So then <laughs> so then did you did you sort of decide to commit yourself fully to being in the band at this stage? Uh, uh well, no, that well, okay. So uh well basically I did that for as long as I could. And then I just basically sooner or later ran out of holiday and I couldn't make the work up even. So when we were gigging a lot, I, I just had to give it up, really. And I gave yes. it up two weeks all around Europe, much to my family's disgust, probably. They were, they were Because it was kind of interesting at that point, because, you know, 79, you know, Thatcher gets in, then we have the, the Falkland oh. War, then mm -hmm. we have Green and Common, there's the sort of minor strike. But then, you know, with a lot of bands in that period, you know, it was the unemployment benefit and the job seekers allowance that sort of gave a lot of people almost an indirect, indirect grant, didn't they, to sort of yeah. um, have a lazy day smoking and drinking quite a bit and then sort of possibly making some music that's a slightly simplistic time but um <laughs> you, if you yeah, bit, slightly, but, yeah. <laughs> but there was but most bands from that period went oh yes that was us actually we got on the job seekers allowance then we mm. you know formed this band and then did the five-year apprenticeship mm. you know so what what was it when did you sort of get together as as the sort of was it a four-piece to begin with it was always a four-piece yeah i mean it was uh that would have been I I always lose track on this. Um, um, it was about eighty odd, eighty one, yeah. And then we all got together with there were th three of us from Banbury, and Pete was from Oxford. Sort of a, a, a mismatch of different bands that, that had been in, in Oxford and Banbury that had all sort of fallen apart or whatever. Um, and then we sort of got together the, the remnants of those got together and it was us and that was uh yeah and so happened play dead yes yeah. that that was the one and your first single that was poison takes a hold wasn't it yes yes what's your memories of that of that well exciting really i mean you know putting out a single I mean, when we got together we were always <clears throat> one of the things we wanted to do was not be a local band not do the usual things that bands were doing you know what that we thought were doing yes <laughs> so to First, first thing was to get a record contract and then and, and then go and record a, a single. And that's what, yeah. So everything was going to plan at that point, which was great and very exciting, yeah. And Fresh Records, who, was that a local label? No, they were in London. They were, they were uh, Edgware Road based. Again, we went, you know, took a demo round. In those days, there used to be this booklet that had, I can't remember what it was called now. It was a booklet that had every single record company and every single agent and every single management company that existed in London and well in Britain, yeah, and buy that book, and you could then go literally, you could go door to door to management record companies and sort of hand them tapes, which you can't do nowadays. But <clears throat> so we did that, um, and we, <clears throat> me and Rob, spent a week in London, just going around everywhere, trying everybody and everything. And trying to get them to listen to it with us generally there, which like, some of them did actually. Yeah. Um, and Alan, we one of the places we sort of went to see was uh, uh, was Fresh Records, and Alan was there, and he must have taken a, a bit of a shine to us. And then he suggested a gig at the Clarendon, 
couple of foot actually, which was underneath the Clarendon in Hammersmith. Yeah, there's like four or five bands playing, uh, and he got us on the bill so that he could come down and see us live. And uh, I suppose he liked what he saw and took us on, yeah. And yes. then right away into the studio, which was fantastic. Because um, I rem- I sort of realised Wasted Youth, who I did an interview with a couple yep. of members, they were on that label as well. That's right, they? they were, yeah. I think they had the famous, um, is it Martin R- Rushall, who was the Joy Division chap? He was their producer yes. on one of their singles. But I think he spent most of the time laying on the floor underneath the controls, just pointing, saying, just turn that a bit and then collapsing again. I think he'd, ha- he'd pass his kind of peak point you know creative point at that stage so did mm. who was your producer at this stage uh well that one we just used the engineer i think and us which was probably foolish but it's you know it's okay um yeah we didn't really use a proper produce well actually though the second single had a, a producer which was a guy called cosmo verico uh who was via my aunt again, and he was the uh, guitarist in the Heavy Metal Kids at the time. Wow. And amongst other bands he'd been with. Um, and that's why that's quite, TVI is quite sort of metally, sort of rocky. He had a bit of a he, influence in the way it sort of came across. But after that, we never really used much many producers. It was always us and the engineer until a lot later on when we, when we joined up with Connie Plank. Right. And that, that all changed. Because at that stage, you get the blessing. Because one of the great things about that period, you know, without being into rose-tinted sunglasses, but there was kind of three weekly music papers, which had a huge circulation, mm-hmm. you know, and Record Mirror. And then we had the great John Peel, didn't we? And Janice Long mm-hmm. and Kid Jensen. But John Peel has such an influence on people. And he gives you the kind of session, which is what every band wants isn't it, at mm. this stage. So do yeah. you, can you remember much about that Um Period in Maid of Vale, or your day in Maid of Vale, really, wasn't it? <laughs> That's all I remember about Maid of Vale. I remember the cheap canteen. <laughs> Everyone mentions the cheap canteen. And, and, and also, <laughs> they loved it, and because we were all very skinny in the 80s. But then also, <laughs> did you have Dale Griffith, the Mott the Hoople, producing you at that stage, or was it at someone else? Do you know what? I'm not actually sure. We're about to, very soon, put out the uh, John Peel sessions, actually. Yes. I yeah, know. on vinyl. Um, uh, it's going to be a bit of a wait because uh, it takes about eight months to get records pressed now. Yes, this is true. I know. So uh, it's, it's gone down in for pressing. So hopefully by summertime, no, sorry, by just after Christmas, I reckon it'll be. Yeah, which hopefully allow. I can't recall who did the the production on it. Um, and was it was it? Uh, so was that it, would be brilliant if it was from Mott the Hoople. Yeah. It would be amazing. Yeah. Well, I'm sure it will be on the record, won't it? You'll have the yeah, yeah. I can look it up for you if you want. Um, well, that's all right. But then you know, who? How did you manage to get a session with John? Was it through his producer, or did well, he... one one hopes it was because he liked us. But yes. Uh, what his producer did, but um, one of the things I, I always love this little story because I one of the things we did when we were touring up and down the country, doing a gig here, doing a gig there, doing a, we always wrote or got our friends to write, write letters to John and we post them from the various towns. Excellent. <laughs> so it would look like we we, were, we had lots of fans all over the place requesting us to be on. Now, whether or not that was the reason why we got the first session, I don't know. It probably. But he was playing stuff like, you know, Dance Society, wasn't he? He was playing a lot of Dance Society. I don't think he was a big fan of us, actually, in, in all honesty. I don't think he was... I don't know. I, yeah, I don't think he was a huge fan of us. But, yeah, he gave us... Two, uh, three sessions in the end. We did three. three. Holes. So they're all coming out on vinyl this year. And they'll all be coming out on vinyl soon, yeah. Mm. It's going to be fantastically exciting. Because I did notice you've got these bootleg live recordings, haven't you, as well, which is yeah. um, down there. And you've got one from live in Norwich, Scarborough. <laughs> Probably. I don't know. Uh, again, I don't. That's all stuff that's happened sort of behind our, our backs, so to speak. Um, <laughs> yes you know then that's another thing part of the indie world isn't it things you you know people put things out don't they yeah they do yeah. put things out and we can't we you know we're not we're not big enough or wealthy enough to sort of try and put stops on these things or try and you know they've come out legitimately in some ways but you know people don't sometimes involve us in them which has been a bit annoying which has been what why actually um alan 
from uh, now Jungle, which was fresh, yes. has sort of got us to do this sort of semi best of which we've just done, and and he's got us to do the peel thing, and we've had full involvement in it, which has been a lot of fun to do, and it's been a lot better, and it's a lot, a lot more satisfying to see a product that's got the cover you wanted to have on it, the songs in the order you wanted, you know, and the songs on it that you wanted on it, rather than something picking up something and thinking, hang on a minute, what's all this about? <laughs> Where did this come from? Which yes. happens a lot with those sort of live things, you know. Yes, but, I, yeah, I guess whatever. they're sometimes a bit cheeky, aren't they, really? But did well, you... they, they can be, yeah. I mean, I, I don't suppose we get any money for them either. <laughs> but, hey, there you go. Well, the worst one, I did an interview with a guy and I said, yeah, I bought your book on Amazon. He, he looked completely boggled. He said, well, I didn't put it on Amazon. It's like, right, OK, but I did buy it. On. He, and he was just like moving on then. He's like, you know, he was like, really? It's on Amazon? I only sold it from my, you know, it was kind of self-published and he was, you know, selling it by his kind of website. Yeah, well, we, had, we had a similar one not so long ago with someone putting something on Apple. Yeah, right. selling, uh, I can't remember what it was. Uh, again, oh, I think it was some of the Peel stuff, actually. But, uh, yeah, instantly we got them shut down. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Do you find that, you know, just be it veering off, because I notice on Spotify you're there and you get, you know, a lot of listeners each month. Mm. Do you find there's more interest in the band recently than there has been for a long time? I'm very unaware of what goes on, really, um, on that front. I mean, I'm uh, don't get me wrong, I'm always glad that people are very enthusiastic. I'm quite surprised sometimes how people are still enthusiastic, but I, I don't really uh, keep an eye on it. I, you know, if it goes great, then fantastic. If it doesn't, then so be it. I'm not that. And I don't. Th and I think the same of all four of us. None of us have a... I mean, we're all fond of the memory of it and what we did and everything else, but I, I don't think we're desperate to be out there you know, pumping it or being aware of what's going on. If people enjoy it, then fantastic. That's great. Yeah. But uh, to be, you know, we're not even very conscious of it, to say the truth. It's just, you know, great. It's there. It's there, but so when you... wants to hear it and therefore gives us the chance to do what we've just done recently. But, but uh, yeah, I'm not, I'm not hunting it down, no. No, because your third single, Propaganda, that's out on Jungle Records, isn't it? Was Is that a subsidiary of Fresh or is that... A totally yeah, well, uh, yeah, that was what Jungle Fresh went down uh, financially, I think. Well, it must have been financially, and uh, and they created Jungle from that. Yeah, Alan, Alan, yeah, Rachel. right. So they they have all your publishing and everything's kind of in that. Well, we actually we tidied everything up at the end when we finished. Uh, 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 um, we ended up with a battle uh, uh, with a, a, a company that bought a load of stuff from clay um and as a consequence of that we thought we'd it might be better to just try and put everything with alan again i mean he was the first one to see us and get the you know put us out there and it just felt comfortable putting it him with it all with him yeah 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 and, and someone else to look after it we none of us have had the time to even think about dealing with publishing or all that business or looking after it all and, uh, you know that's, that's what alan does so it just seems sensible to put it in his hands and and, and, he, and he's never going to do anything unless you know it always come to us first if it was something was going to happen or yes absolutely uh, so then 83 your your album comes out so hmm. that's that's kind of quite a major moment but this is with the producer isn't it roy roland so well roy was a was well yeah roy was um he was an engineer at heart i mean that's what i mean yes he takes gets a production credit but he was an engineer uh, uh, and worked with us so yes yeah, so he got a he got a production credit really yeah yeah of course yeah but it wasn't it wasn't really well i suppose i'm being naive there to think that we could have done it ourselves no he he was a big influence in it yeah that's that's for sure yeah, yeah. yes did you what was where did you record that <laughs> that was done at uh, Tendo Nakasaki's studio in uh, in Elephant Castle. He had a uh, Kendo Nakasaki was a wrestler. I don't know if you recall him. He had one hit single, <laughs> and he was an international wrestler. So he was always on the telly on Saturday afternoon on ITV. So would, that, would he been in that world of Big Daddy and Giant Hayes? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
he used to wear the mask. So you no one ever saw him. Yes, I mean, remember in those nice tights. <laughs> it's kind of in, in, yes. In, so he had a, he had a basement studio which he built. I don't know if that's before he made his first single or or that's where he did his single. And uh, he used to let it out and and quite a few bands from Jungle went down there actually. Yeah, I think Cuddly Toys. Recorded down there. I think they were another jungle band. Blimey. And did the session go? Did you have it all demoed beforehand and went into the Most studio? of it was written, yeah. It was all all written. Uh, that yeah, that was all written, yeah. Yeah. Yes. And you it's were... not really an album, it's, it's a sort of mini album, actually. It's not a full album. Right. Is it it's kind not... of the because the original was the was it client titled The The First Flower? Yeah. Yeah. Then that came out. And then so the first proper album is from the promised land. That's correct. And we'd left we left Jungle by then. We were in we were Clay Records then, yeah. Right. What was the reasoning for that? Oh, I think we just felt we needed to move on, I suppose. <laughs> and also, I mean, Clay were offering us, I suppose, more money to go and record so we could go and do it better, you know, record. Yeah. I mean, we were really into going into the studio. We loved going into the studio. We loved playing live, but the studio was fantastic. It was good fun. Yeah, we messing about with things, and yeah, and I suppose having you know not having producers telling us everything, so we you know we we were able to sort of do what we wanted a lot easier than I should imagine other bands who had producers. Yes, were able to do you know. Yeah, and did you did you as a band come together? You know, did you all take an equal sort of share in the sort of songwriting, or was yes, was there always, a particular yeah. process? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's how we wrote, though. I mean, we used to jam it out, really. Drum us, you know, someone would come up with a riff or I'd come up with a drum rhythm and then we'd sort of create a song around that. And then Rob would find some vocals that suited the, the mood. And uh, bingo, yeah. Had you yeah. developed quite a, a following at this stage? I should imagine at that point, yes, we were. I mean, we would, yeah. Uh, you know, we were doing gigs up and down the country. i say we'd sort of do about three four hundred a night if we were playing and maybe eight hundred a thousand in, in london if that's at that time yeah did going on the tube make much of a, a impact on the band you would have hoped so wouldn't you but it didn't really didn't it no in fact we put a lot of hope onto that one actually we were hoping we'd go the next then what we at that point because that's quite late and on actually when we went on the tube at that point we were hoping that that would be the thing that might just zoom us up to the next stage and get us out of a transit van <laughs> but it didn't <laughs> yes. and I think actually i think that realization then that if you know if we did the tube and nothing changed i mean how's it going to change so no, i think that was the uh you've reached the end of it by then <laughs> yeah well it's yeah. interesting because i did an interview with that uh the guitarist with jj um twisted sister JJ French and I think they'd been touring or gigging in New York around New York for about 10 years and no one would touch them even though they had been you know massive following but every record company said I don't want that band on my label and then it was a a show you know a live performance on the tube that sort of got them noticed by somebody right they got signed and that was like suddenly okay the 80s suddenly developed by the end of the 80s they declared bankrupt after being sending millions of records it all goes terribly wrong oh but, dear uh, <laughs> absolutely because most because i guess you know you probably heard this so many times but most bands and you've got quite a classic narrative have a five-year don't they period of they get together they you know have that 12-month honeymoon get a single the john peel session or two first album things going well second album not climbing bad. that ladder it's all yes. fun. It gets better and better and better it's looking kind of good but then it's like that moment where there's like, well, how much money have we got and are we enjoying it? And it's like, mm, not quite sure. You know, so and the crowds came... get a little thinner. <laughs> <laughs> was that was because the 80s, I mean, you know, I didn't realize well, I did in a way, but they were so tribal as well, wasn't it? There were so many different little groups and subgroups. Did you pick up a little, you know, were you part of any particular scene at this stage? Uh well, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I suppose we were we were sort of classified in the goth zone, although I don't really know why that was, because we were sort of more we were sort of more a, a rock band, a sort of metal band. I mean, I don't know, does Killing Joke come under the word goth? 
it can do can't it <laughs> you know i know i don't know i mean you get you get certain bands that always get squeezed in even though they would all fight against it but you know you think oh go on you would be at the back cave but you you're a bit too heavy for the back cave really aren't you well you think so yeah we did play the back cave or we used to go down there yeah um i'd like to think so i'd like to think that we were a lot heavier than that but we did get sort of grouped in in that 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 sort of crowd and not that it was a bad thing but um yeah, not that it was a bad thing at all, but uh, uh, yeah, we did get labelled with the goth thing. But I, I suppose that's because we, the, some of the supports we did were obviously goth bands. I mean, we did the Sex Gang Children's support, which was, I mean, they were the, the top of the bills in the in the in the goth world. Yes, but um, but you know, uh, yeah, I, I suppose we, we gained a lot of following from that actually. So, and I suppose it's just people who were involved in golf sort of just followed us through it and came with us you know into the next next stage so well, there was like the mission the sisters and you know mercy and the fields of nephilim and exactly, I, yeah. you would have it was all around that same time wasn't it yeah you know, Bauhaus people like that so when you came to do your your the next album um which was company of justice what was the yeah. atmosphere like with the band at that stage oh really good I mean again that was uh well uh, yeah it was good I mean we, we were feeling ready to uh, ready to do this next move up we wanted to get a lot of the bands that had supported us were like touring america or had signed up to big labels and were uh, and were managed to make a living out of it and we and, and connie plank came along as a as an opportunity to he sort of was interested in in producing us and that sounded like fantastic and we went off to germany to his studio to record it and yes, there was a lot of this could be it thing. You know, this could be the next step up. This yes. could get a transit van that got us to Connie Blank. <laughs> <laughs> but, but but again, suddenly, you know, at the end of it all, it didn't really happen again. You know, we sold the same amount of records as last time. We're still playing the same sort of venues. Um, yeah, it still didn't happen. But but at the point when we went into the studio, yeah, we were on a high. I mean. To have Connie Plank at that time, what a result that was! Yes, but he came over. He flew over to Banbury, where we were rehearsing, and sat down. and And we'd already written all the songs, and, uh, and he sat down in the studio with us and just listened to us playing them. And then just said, "Yeah, come on over. I'll I'll record it for you." And what a result that was! <laughs> well, absolutely, that's mm. amazing. Did you um, did you? change the songwriting at all did you sort of or any of the processes involved because you knew you were going to jail? no we, we we did it all exactly the same as we we'd done it from day one really yeah same idea you know we just all gather together someone would come out with a riff blah 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 um uh, but we can't the only thing we the difference was with connie he knew how to he, yeah it, it, it suddenly explained to us what a, what a producer does and if the producer is really into the music and how he can how he can really change it all for the better, bring the best out of everything. Um, and that's what, yeah, that's what he created from, from, from us being there. Yeah. How long did that session take? It was only two weeks, actually. That's recorded and mixed. That's yeah. incredibly tense, um, intense time, isn't it? So when the when the album came out, did you go on a quite a big tour at that stage? It wasn't a huge tour because, uh, again, I can't recall. I mean, this is a long time ago. I can't recall how it all played, but pretty soon we did a tour. We did a few shows, yes. We did a small tour, I'm sure. But uh, by that point, it was really, yeah, what with the tube, and this album, which we thought was great, it just not happening. Yeah, it was just yeah, we couldn't we couldn't carry on anymore, really. Oh my god, that's so sad. It, well, it was it was terrible. It was it was very sad. I mean, because you know, we, we I think we had such high hopes for it all, we really did. But you know, yeah, it's just the way it is, isn't it? So when the album, the the live into the fire, was that a that was uh, back again. That's you, you, that's going back again. That was in the clay days, right? Uh, in the clay, again. That was something we did in Oxford, which was like a. I don't know why we actually chose to do it, but um, yeah, we chose to do it. Uh, do it, and yeah, yeah, yeah. It was. 
live gig. <laughs> it was a live gig. So was it a case? We, we, well, of... we were a live band, really. You know, <laughs> even in the studio, we tried to play live. Yes. And did you all come together and sit around the table and say, to quote Jim Morrison, "This is the end"? Or did you? How did it? How did it all sort of? How did it actually end? <laughs> how did it end? What was that moment when you realised it was over? <laughs> I, I think Steve was the one who walked out and said, "I, I can't do this anymore." And I think. I mean, he he only he was he was the catalyst really of what probably we were all thinking at the time, you know. Just I mean, you can only travel up and down the country in the transit van with the gear in the back for so long, <laughs> and we were doing it, you know. That's, that was our it was our living, but we didn't have a, we didn't make a penny out of it because we always used to reinvest everything into the band. Yes, you no, know, everyone was signing on when we when we were recording that album. Can I say this? I don't know. When we recorded that album, the guys the others had to fly home to sign on. <laughs> right. I think you're fine now. It's only 40 years ago, isn't it? Yeah, I know. But um, yeah, it's, it was, you know, it's hard. It was hard to try and live that like that and, you know, yeah, have bread and butter in front of you still. Yes. Well, I, yeah, this is it. You know, as I sort of said at the start, it was, it was through that kind of having a meager little indirect grant from the government, you know, mm. of, of 30. You know, seven pound and fifty p, and then the housing benefit and the uh, council tax paid. Mm. And you were broke by the end of the two weeks. <laughs> and exactly, yeah. But what better way to spend your time than, than actually maybe just you know doing gigs and making music, yeah? And, and which hundreds, thousands did. It was great. Yes, this is true. I know so many bands were like, mm. one minute you're there, and then you, I'm on top of the pops. I better quickly sign off. And they'll, they'll notice me quickly. Yes, I know it was a good one. So then, what do you what do you do then when you've had that? Because five years is quite a chapter, especially when you're in your you know, early years. That's a big percentage of your life. What what do you then head towards next? Well, um, we had a little. I mean, Rob and I, and and actually Steve came out. We had a little thing we tried, but they didn't work, and for one reason or another. And then um, I suppose I flitted off to London and Rob went down to Brighton and we all just went our separate ways. Rob started doing his thing and I started trying to find a band in London. Uh, but I felt like I was always, I was auditioning them rather than them auditioning me. Right. <laughs> or it wasn't the sort of music I wanted to play or whatever. And I sort of gave up with that really after a while. Did uh, you Pete all went down did to it, France? Pete went down to it, France and formed a band with um with some friends down there who did quite well, I think. Because you all, you know, because there's one project that Rob and Pete have, Mankind's Audio Development. Oh no, that, that that was we all did that. The mad thing. That right. was something else we did. Is Rob Rob found I can't remember who it was. was it Red? No, it wasn't Red Rhino. Put it out. It was, I can't remember who put it out, but they they offered us to go into a studio under a different name and invite friends down and make this danceable disco track. <laughs> Have you listened to it? No. Is it worth it? <laughs> it's, not it very worth play it? Dead. it's not very play dead. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, it's like a sort of funky sort of disco vibe. Well, I shouldn't say disco, but, you know, like a rocky disco vibe. Right. And, um, yeah, we invited friends down and put it out. Yeah, yeah. So did you say you went down to the south of France to form a band? No, oh, Pete went down to the south of France after we split up and he sort of formed another band. Right. With some friends. And yeah, they did okay down in France for a while, yeah. Did yeah. you sort of, when when the sort of 90s crept in and you started seeing all those bands appearing on top of the pops, you know, did you sort of have a moment where you thought we could have been there? Be <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I don't. I mean... No, no. I just the way I look at it all is I just see it as, as it was a fantastic apprenticeship doing that thing. It was great. Um, it's a shame it didn't go to anything more, but you know, even if it had, maybe that wouldn't. You know, all those bands that did do better than us, there's very few of them still going. So, you know, or, yes. or lasted much longer than us, actually. You know, yeah, and it's sometimes nice. So, did you? Just go back for the career, or did you keep music going on in the background, playing in various, you know, musical combos? No, I didn't do any playing at all. Uh, I, in fact, what I ended up doing, is I ended up dispatch riding around London for about two or three years. And then uh, a friend of mine asked if I'd like to be 
a roadie. And that was about 80, 88, I think it was. Right. Or, and it was to be with Terence Trent Darby. Nice. Nice. Uh, Good old uh, yes. And, uh, and my first gig with him, I was very, con- I, I wasn't sure if I wanted to do it because sitting looking after a drummer who's doing what I want to be doing didn't seem really quite right in my head at the time. Yes. But uh, luckily, the drummer was absolutely fantastic, a guy called Jeff Dunn. And my first gig with Terence was the Grammys in New York. Uh, I remember flying to New York. Never been to America before. Uh, the tour manager put me in the front seat of this limo where we got to check out to go into town. Our hotel was in Times Square. My room must have been bigger than my flat at the time. <laughs> and and I was getting things like PDs, which is a daily rate we get, you know, when you when you're roadie and uh when you're out on the road. Uh, and thinking even the PDs is more money than I'd had <laughs> by dead. Yes. Uh and it didn't take a lot to fathom out that, you know, maybe this is a good career move. <laughs> I've been doing it since actually. Have you? Mm. That was you know you were there on the road as, as a tre- as, as a um a drum tech as a drum tech then yeah but I've done other things since I've been production managers and tour managers and things like that mm. and, I actually, a... and actually with with Terence I was his uh I was his uh, motorbike roadie as well nice nice because <laughs> I did an in- I did a quite an interesting interview with him about three years ago and it was did like, you really wow. Yeah. Was he still going under the name Terence Trent Darby? Oh, no, no. That was no. definitely do not mention. No. It was kind of strange because I got a list of all the things I couldn't say or mention. So it was. Oh, like, wow. OK, yeah. Yeah, I'm sure. I mean, what a singer. What a voice. Absolutely yes. amazing. I, 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 was, I was in the studio with him for the second and third album. The third album is when it all sort of collapsed. Actually. Was that when he was channeling John Lennon? Did he mention? Sort of, he, no, he was doing this sort of print. He was playing. He played all the instruments. He was doing doing a do, sort of prints. Yes. Um, playing all the instruments, which he did okay with, but and the songwriting was really good, and his voice was remarkable. But the songs were very not what people wanted to hear after hearing the first album which was the hard line which was all yes. the pop songs and then he went into this sergeant pepper's thing um yeah it wasn't what people wanted to hear and so of course his record sales just dropped and then the record company lost interest and yeah it was sad it was it was quite that was really hard actually that third album we were doing they literally pulled the plug on us halfway to, halfway through um and it was a shame. Some great songs. Recording it with Chad Blake, who's a fantastic engineer producer. Yes. Yeah. No. I. I, I kind of. Yeah. It was quite interesting. But, I have to uh, say though. I have to say though. It's, it's his second album. I thought was a bit. It was a bit over the top. But I think he got. He got a better sense of, of making. This self music, by the third album. The third album. Was, the songwriting is fantastic, absolutely fantastic, and and the recording was great. It just wasn't there weren't any hits. In fact, he wrote us. There's one hit on it, which sounds like a song that the record company said you've got to go into the studio and write a hit single with someone, even though it doesn't sound anything else like the rest of the album. <laughs> yeah, I just and that's yeah. what he did, and that's what sort of kept it going. But the album itself is utterly fantastic. Did the second album have the word fish in it? Yes, neither fish nor flesh. That's yeah. the one. Yeah, yeah. And I seem to remember he came out with a comment which was a bit, you know, like channeling the spirit of John Lennon or something. Or yeah, possibly uh, he was into all that then. Yeah. Yeah, he he yes, he said some interesting things. He was yeah, it was fine. <laughs> <laughs> He's an interesting guy, <laughs> and he's still making you know his uh, albums as his you know other you know the other character now. So anyway, that's good. So who did you then sort of work with during the nineties? Oh, all sorts of bands. I mean, I was out on the road a lot then. I was, uh, I mean, from him I went to Brian Ferry, who just bought out Bet Noir. What a fantastic right. album that was. Um, then I did a lot of smaller bands like Jesus Jones and 
the Mary Chain, who actually I drummed on both with both of those bands actually in the end. Fantastic. Good um, old Jesus Jones and the Mary Chain. And the Mary Chain, yeah. The Mary Chain was a fantastic tour. I did that. Um yeah, did, you, did you come across Alan McGee in that time? No, because they were no, I didn't actually. It's sort of he, he he was sort of out of the picture by then, I think. It was uh Honey's Dead album. Right. I'm sure he was probably still involved, but uh yeah, it was it was yeah, Honey Dead's Honey's Dead album, yeah. Blimey, there you go. So is that you know, you just continued your life in, in sort of music up to the current day? Uh yeah, until this very day. I did all yeah, lots of in fact I did a band which you, Paul, from Whipping Boy, I looked after them. I was actually listened to your interview with Paul. Oh, uh, Whipping Boy, yes. Mm. God damn. Yes, they were good. You know, mm. at the end. So did you did you manage to keep interest in music or was it did you just have it as a much more of a kind of professional occupation or did you still or do you still love them you know the bands you worked with i'm lucky that i love the bands i work with yeah yeah i'm lucky i've been very blessed with that actually because it must be hard when you don't like the band you're working with and you have to put up with them for a year no i've been blessed with that one actually i've been very lucky to be with a lot of bands that even if i didn't like them then i certainly did at the end yeah yeah. That's fantastic. And was there anybody that you worked with that surprised you, you know, with their talent or, you know? Well, the you... Mary Chain was one. I'm, I remember being quite apprehensive because I kept thinking of the first album. I was thinking, I'm not going to enjoy this. And then when I heard Head On, I thought, wow, this is something else. And then hearing Honey's Dead, I thought, and Darklands as well. I mean, every album they put out was so different from the one before. Absolutely brilliant. Um, so yeah, that was that, that was a real eye opener, you know, working with them. Yeah. Yes. And if you could have whispered something to your like sixteen year old self starting out, is there anything that you'd have told them? Wear ah. earplugs. <laughs> Wear earplugs. <laughs> did you did you you did your hear and manage to survive this world? <laughs> this one's a little gone, <laughs> but I, I actually say that's from the Play Dead days when I had a great big monitor right pumping down my ear and nowadays yes we wear in ears so we don't have to have it on full volume we can control it a little easier now yes yeah so, yeah, so on the on the sort of me on the kind of life's lessons is there anything you would have wanted to whisper to your 16 year old self that would have helped or been directed you elsewhere do you know i often i one thing i always think about when i was with the with play dead is that it was always hard work sometimes it always felt like it didn't it, well, I mean, I did enjoy it, but I feel like we could have enjoyed it a lot more. Um, you know, we were self-managing for a lot of the time until we got Psy and we were, you know, organising everything ourselves. And all that is, all that's great fun, I suppose. But it would have been nice if we could have just been a band going out there, playing music and whatever, and, and had the money to have a or, or, or a manager who, who could look after all that and make sure we had money in your pocket. So we all we had to think about was having fun and doing the music, you know. Yes. But um it, it was all very serious at times. You know, I mean, it has that, to be. I, the, I guess that's the joy of youth. We were sort of very mm. angsty and yeah, lonely. of course. You know, the eighties was full of it, wasn't it really? And when mm. when did the idea come to put this collection together, a kind of the best of, which is titled the book the collection? Well, Alan Alan approached us and said he thought it might be a good idea to bring that uh, you know to have that um i mean we're heading towards well there's this we've just put out um we've got the peel sessions coming up and then in time we're heading towards getting a whole box set thing of everything so and i think alan wanted to put the box set out but he thought the idea it might be i start to sort of stagger it up to the box set <laughs> if you know what i mean <laughs> <laughs> I'm impressed. Who puts your website together? It's a really nice. That's you know, Ad, who's 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 uh, who's been a fan for years and years, and and just uh, looked after the website for us. In fact, I think he, someone else, was doing that website, and Ad bought into it so he could control it. Uh, and he looks after that for well, not for us. He looks after it for himself, really. But it's our benefit. But um, we're forever grateful to that. For that. But, uh, yeah, he sort of and keep, and he, 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 he's the one that keeps it alive, really. 
Right, because he's put this lovely, you know, it's really tidy, it's clean, you've got mm. your merchandise, and who who organises the merch as well? Well, again, that... I, I, that's from somewhere in America, I believe, someone who, who decided they want to put some merch of ours out, and, oh, yeah, by all means do it, yeah. We don't have much <laughs> involvement, we've all got real jobs now, which sort of makes, you know, <laughs> you, you, A, doesn't give you the time to deal with all of this, you know, you know, it's hard to sort of, you know, put all that time in, so yeah, we just sort of let people do what, providing we're happy with it. And someone says, "Can we do this?" And we go, "Yeah, all right, yeah, what's well, that's fine." Yeah. yeah. And do you appear on many Cherry Red record, you know, clock compilations? Cherry is Red, it? yes. Mm. I've been going to AFC Wimbledon recently. They're <laughs> they're sponsored by Cherry Red. Cherry Red's right next door to the ground. Um, right. I I yes. I I, I think we. I don't know if we've been on many Cherry Reds, but I'm sure we are there somewhere. Yeah. Because that's often one place that people discover a band. So I just wondered if you were sort of finding or somebody could say, you know, our audience is dropping. The age is going much lower at the moment. Young kids are discovering us for the first time. Well, I think that's why I don't want to do this sort of best of as well, to sort of put that out and get the name out again and try and stir up some more. Yeah, some some energy, yeah. Yeah. Yes. God, that's fantastic. Well, look, this has been fantastic. Well, thank you ever so much for your time. This has been brilliant. And um, if you want, I can always send is it aid? It's um that aid, person. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And I can send him the link and he can always put it oh, on. Oh, that'd be website. great. Yeah. Please but do, that, yeah, that, yeah, yeah. That'd be good, actually. Yeah. But yeah, thank you ever so much. And amazing stories, actually. Um <laughs> it's always it's always nice to hear how a band is. And and it's nice that, you know, with your band, it all sounds really sort of amazingly tidy actually there's well, nothing I, I don't know if it is really but <laughs> it was good fun when we did it like with any band you know like i say you know when you're climbing that ladder all the way up it's great but what's uh what's the um do you know the song guitar man by bread not really but i will have oh, a listen. give that a listen it's fantastic it's about a guitarist who's sort of up on that climb and he's enjoying it but then he gets to the top and the crowds start thinning, and <laughs> <it's> just, <laughs> but he still loves to play, so he keeps going and going and going. Fantastic song. Yeah, well, it's interesting because some people can cope with it going going from Norwich Arts Centre the to the waterfront to the UEA to sort of Cambridge, mm. to the, and then can cope with the kind of okay, it's coming down, but we'll we'll just cut our expenses and we'll keep this going a bit longer. And other people just can't. It's like sorry. We played the oh, main yeah. stage. Yeah, a, a lot of band, a lot of bands actually prefer that sometimes. I mean, um, uh, you know, prefer just to don't want all the hassle that goes with the bigger the gig gets. Actually, they prefer the small, more intimate touring. Yes, yeah, where where the responsibility is less, you know, and you haven't got all this huge amounts of money flying around, which you know, arena tours inevitably have. You know, and it's all about the money. But, um, you know, prefer to do smaller gigs and just enjoy a bit more and take the pressure off them. Yes, and have a bit of control on what's happening. Rather yeah, than yeah, 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 yeah. Being confused about who's doing what. Well, exactly, yeah. When you've got 70, 80 people travelling with you. I mean... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What was it? Is Brian... Was, did you say... Who was before Brian Ferry, did you say? It was Terence um, Trent Derby I was with. Him. Was that the biggest artist you've worked with? Because he was huge during that 80s period. He was he? really huge. But even then, you know, being huge wasn't arenas. Right. Not many bands did... You know, there, there were some did arenas and stadiums, but the arena... It was kind of when really... the arena wasn't there. That was the kind well, of... Well, it was, but it wasn't... It, but it, it wasn't like a... It's not like it is now when, you know, all bands head of That's what they're aiming for, to do the arena. Yes. It, we were doing theatres around America with Terence, and this was a, a Grammy Award-winning artist. And at that point, he'd already sold about 8 million of that album, that first album. And yet we're still doing theatres around America. And the second album, same thing. We just did clubs and theatres. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Cool. Who was your biggest band or artist you worked with on the... Probably the one I'm with now, which is Month and the Sons. Gosh, there you go. And that, dear listener, is the end of the interview. You probably guessed that. But a massive thank you to Mark Whiff-Smith.
I think that's his nickname there, Whiff. So, um, yes, from the band Play Dead. Like I said, they've got a very good website. So if you want to check that out, that is worth doing. Um, I could give you the link, in fact, which would be very organised of me. Yes, if you just, it goes, well, just go Play Dead. But also it goes as www then it's companyofjustice.com, so do check that out. And like I said, they have got a new album that has just come out, which is a collection titled The Collection, and they've got various other bits and pieces. Anyway, this has been the C86 Show, David East. So if you want to contact me, you can on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, just do C86 Show. All these have been archived, aren't you lucky? So you can find those on Spotify, iTunes, Podbeam. It's true. Anyway, have a great week. Stay safe.